So welcome to the first uh, Lunch and Learn session. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, be opening the party. And uh, I'm very happy to present the, the team in Chile Lab and the project, one of the projects that we're working on. So when I say a rich learning scenarios at scale, hopefully you'll get a sense of what I mean by rich learning scenarios. At scale actually means both um, many students, could be 200 when you're used to 20, could be 2,000 or 20,000 if you want to go to the MOOCs or if you want to go to uh, other kinds of informal learning. But it also means scaling uh, horizontally and saying instead of having, you know, what re science, learning science researchers often do is they go to one lab, they work very intensively with one teacher, they might develop custom software, they test some theory, they publish it, and if you go there and say, hey, that was really neat, can we use that in our lab? Um, often the, the, question, the answer is we don't have the resources for that. It's not generalizable enough. So we're really looking at how can we take a lot of the theory and a lot of the technology and also make it available much more widely. So let's just start with a scenario. Uh, there's lots of different topics at EPFL, different, different kinds of epistemology, learning theory. Uh, but let's say we want to use simulations because we've heard that active learning is good for students to really understand the underlying concepts. And of course, there's a great amount of really high quality simulations available online. So yes, we found a simulation that fits into our curriculum goal. However, we know that whether students are doing experiments or working with simulations, just playing around with that activity itself isn't enough to really learn, right? We would like them to have some research questions, maybe formulate some hypotheses. Once they've done the experiment, they need to analyze the result, uh, they might need to go back and, and iterate. So, you know, so, so we started with running a simulation. Now we're saying they need to produce a hypothesis. Maybe it's good for the students to argue about the hypothesis. And then we know there's a lot of research about multiple representations. So if you want students to under, understand really the underlying concept, you don't just show them a graph. You might also show them a table or a formula or even a piece of, of software, the algorithm, um, or a, a simulation, a visual simulation. So now we need to compare different representations. And then, you know, one, one neat trick for learning is actually advanced organizers. So Pierre um, often talks about this example where he's teaching actually a, a, a kind of a troubled class in, um, I think, secondary school. And he had them play uh, this battleship commander, where you have to you know, plot uh, um, where you're going to shoot. And they played that for half an hour. And then he started doing matrix calculation. And he found that they were uh, in vectors. And he found that they were learning much, much quicker. So we can kind of pre-activate knowledge structures among the students. And we can also help them interpret the results that they get from the simulation or the experiment. Right? They can uh, run multiple experiments. They can plot the data in different ways. So th this is becoming quite complex for what we started with just a kind of a simple, nice um, simulation. And then once we've gone through all of this, the teacher maybe gives a little lecture. And then you want the students to really consolidate this knowledge, to, to exercise, to really get it, uh, to get very uh, fluent in this skill. And now it's starting to just be very chaotic. Um, we can thank Pierre Dillenberg for these wonderful simulations. <laughs> So the first thing we can do to try to make some sense out of this, let's assume that this is happening in a, in a traditional classroom. So there's a time scale. You have 60 minutes. And we can start kind of sequencing these in time. So we'll start with an advanced organizer. We'll have the students produce an hypothesis. We'll want them to argue about it. They'll run the simulation. They'll maybe compare different representations of the result. They'll maybe use some tools to help them reflect about it. Then you'll give them a talk to make sure that they really get the, the, the con concept and can connect it to other things they've learned. And then you have them do in exercises. So OK, now this is looking a little bit more um, easy to handle. Another way we can organize this, so we can add some time information. We can also separate it into activities that students do by themselves, even if they're in a classroom, but they're working individually. Uh, students at the uh, groups, activities that they do in groups or in pairs, and activities with the whole class and the teacher. So let's say we start by having an advanced organizer for the whole class. 
We ask the students to produce a hypothesis individually. They can argue about it. Obviously, you'll need more than one person. Uh, they can run the simulation and work on the representations in, in groups. You'll have a, a lecture for the whole class. And then you'll have them do exercises individually in class or maybe as homework. So this is a nice kind of representation because it gives us the time scale. And at a glance, we see a little bit the, the social flow because we want we want to make sure that we um, have students working on different planes and with different activities and that this actually makes sense in terms of our learning goals. If we wanted to make this thing happen though in a, a large classroom, we also need some concept of information flow. So for example, after the students have formed individual hypotheses, we might want to have a little machine, we call them operators, which automatically form pairs of learners with conflicting hypotheses. Because we think that pairs with different hypotheses will have more interesting discussions than two people who totally agree. And then after uh, they run the simulation, we might want to give different representations to each team member. So you see a graph, I see a formula, he sees um, some other visualization, and now when we're discussing, um, we are maybe uh, forced to kind of explain ourselves in a different way than if we're looking at the same thing. After the reflection tools, we might want to aggregate the different opinions from the different groups and be able to use this for a debriefing. And finally, we might want to assign different exercises to each student based on which representation they saw. So now, this is and quite an interesting pedagogical approach, a learning design, um, which could be used. The nice thing is it's fairly complex in one way. The concept is not so complex, but it's also reusable because it can, it can actually work with many different kinds of simulations or, or concepts. And this would be different if you're teaching math, programming, uh, business, but there are these kind of patterns that we can identify, that we can see whether we can find very effective ones and which we can then try to spread. So this is the basis for the orchestration graph um, theory, where, which Pierre wrote, wrote the book about. And when I came two years ago, uh, what we were tr aiming to do was to build a platform where you could design and run these orchestration graphs. So on the one hand, this is a tool for learning design. It could be useful for you to draw this on a piece of paper as you're planning a particularly complex lesson. All right? So already it, it has a value. But the question is, with 200 students, with all these moving parts and pieces, there aren't really good systems that let you do all of that. Right? There are bits and pieces here and there, but getting them all to flow together is hard. So we're building Frog, um, which has rich configurable learning tools, which supports synchronous collaboration. Right? If you're in the classroom, you're working with someone else, it needs to be synchronous. Uh, there's dashboards for teacher orchestration, because the idea is not for the teacher to press play and go home, but for the teacher to be really monitoring what's happening with individuals, with groups, preparing for maybe the debrief, uh, changing the script based on what's happening. If nobody did the homework, maybe you need to uh, change a bit uh, the sequence, right? You have this uh, rich content flowing, right? So you have a data flow. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples. So here's the first example. This is an EPFL course in digital learning. These students are mostly computer scientists. They've never thought about learning other than machine learning. I mean, they did a lot of learning in their lives, but they haven't really necessarily reflected upon it. So this was a lesson for the first class. And the goal was partially to be kind of an icebreaker, get the students thinking and talking, and uh, to really connect some of their personal learning experiences with some of the topics in the course, and also motivate them, of course. Uh, so the topics was, first of all, kind of what's learning? You know, really expand a bit the students' vision of learning from just school learning to from you know, from a PhD to how to tie your shoelaces, and also connecting then these, this spectrum of learning to different learning technologies that we would be touching upon in the course. So the, the idea that uh, Pierre had for this course was saying, well, you know, let's start with something simple. 
we'll do a survey about students' ideas about learning. And then we'll show them the results and we'll briefly talk about it. This is very similar to any of you who have used clickers to kind of do opinion polls or, or things like this. Then we'll ask the students, write one thing that you thought was difficult to learn and why was it hard? And then classify that thing you wrote into um, different categories. You'll see. Then the teacher does a quick debrief. He does a lecture. I'm gonna, not going to show you that whole lecture. But he does a lecture for 45 minutes about all kinds of different learning technologies. Uh, it's kind of a survey of the whole course in the first, first lesson. Then we form pairs of students. Students in pairs see each other's learning challenges. And they're asked which learning technology would be useful for this learning challenge. The teacher debriefs. So, not super complicated, but you know, there's a fair amount of stuff going on here. And this was integrated into a one and a half hour lesson. So there was a lot of lecturing, but this was really breaking it up and bringing students in constantly instead of having them just lean back in the first. Um... Now, if we look at the social planes here, we have some individual activities. We have some whole class activities. And we have some uh, group activities, right? So let's try to put that on an orchestration graph. Now, it looks slightly different than the previous ones you saw, but this is the same idea. This is from Frog, our tool. So here you see the sequence, you see the activities, and you see the social planes, individual, team, whole class. Now let's add, so this looks fairly clean. Now it's going to get more complicated because we're going to add the data flow. We're working on making this much more intuitive. This is an interesting, if anyone is interested in data arc information, visualization, stuff like that, I think this is a really interesting problem to work on. But the cool thing is that we can express all of these different uh, flows, whether we are forming groups, whether we are sending information, um, without any coding. So it's not perfect, but it's already um, quite interesting. Now, what does this look like in practice? So here's four students. And the first thing, as you remember, is an individual quiz. So since it's individual, each person does it by themselves. Now, while the students are working on this quiz, and here you see the graph again, and this is kind of the, the dashboard when the teacher is driving the lesson. So the teacher can see the graph. He sees right now that we're on the first activity. How do you learn? So it's an it's a individual activity. And the teacher always has access to the dashboards. And there are multiple dashboards depending on the kind of tool or activity. So right now it's a quiz. Of course, the teacher can look at uh, the answers that students are giving in real time. But there's also a bunch of other dashboards here. For example, we're predicting when students will finish answering the quiz and so on. So this is to help the teacher monitor while the students are working individually. Because you know the feeling. When, when you talk, you think people are paying attention. They might not, but you have this feeling. The moment people start working on their laptops, you feel this loss of control. And you don't quite know uh, what we find actually in our own research, that uh, teachers often go to move on the way too quickly. So we go back and analyze the logs and what the students were doing. We're seeing they were actually engaged in really productive behavior, and they should have been allowed to continue longer. But the teacher was antsy. And OK, OK, let's, let's move on. Right? So hopefully, just highlighting this kind of information, seeing how the students are working, can make the teacher also feel a bit more relaxed, say, yes, OK, they're still actually uh, productively engaged, and I should let them work a bit longer. Um, now, in this case, the teacher wants to uh, show this dashboard to the students. So this is uh, another view that is projected. And here, the teacher is showing um, and, and saying, oh, that's interesting, maybe. Now, so again, this was not so much more uh, fancy than, uh, than a typical clicker system. But here, you have the second step, which was, what is something that was difficult for you to learn? So I'll say Russian, and I'll say it's because of the grammar. So I'll add this topic. And now I'm asked to classify it. So I can move. In this case, we have this little graphical organizer. This is just a background image. So this could be anything. Uh, and you see here, every student does this again individually. Now, here's this operator. This is the first operator we're seeing. 
And what it's doing is just saying, hey, I want all of those individual items on the same board so that I can show them and do a little debrief as a teacher. Here it's, here it's with the names. We can also make it anonymous. It's up to the teacher. As I said, the teacher then lectures for 45 minutes, shows lots of very cool demos from our lab, from, from other labs at EPFL, MOOCs, intelligent tutoring system, robots. And then we put them in pairs. So here's these two are actually paired. And that means that they can, for example, uh, chat with each other. So we gave them a chat. And they have this little interface. Now, in this case, we didn't ask them to move because we didn't want this to take too long. We could ask them to move. We, sometimes we also ask them to work with the person next to them and that we have an uh, interface where it's easy to just identify who's next to each other. Um, in this case, we wanted them to just sit where they are. You can chat with someone else in the class. So this also scales to 200 students if you want. And here we have a different background image <laughs> that represents different learning technologies. And we asked them, move your partner's item to the learning technology that you think would be useful for them. Now, we could let them move any item, but we want to often make it a bit harder for students because then they might actually chat with each other. They might actually try to convince each other. And that's where some of the learning is happening. And then the final thing is, of course, we send these items to the teacher, and the teacher can do another debriefing. So that's how the script was working. Um, what you saw there was some activity types, tools that you maybe haven't seen before. But the most important thing is really this data flow, that you can generate data in one tool, you can send it to another tool. You can send data from individual to group, from individual to whole class. Uh, and the teacher is, is monitoring this uh, real time. I'll give you another example from another context. This was you know, 30 students, master class, seminar style. What about 160 undergrads? This is a course on visual computing at EPFL. So students coming in here, they're learning about HCI, about how their eye works, about you know, the FITS law. And probably they have strong opinions about the interfaces that they like. And so if computer scientists just design the interface that they personally prefer, might not be so good for all the rest of us. Um, so the goal of this was to have the students kind of personally experience some different interfaces, uh, discuss with someone, and then also re reconcile their opinions, not only with someone else, but also with actual data and with their experience. Right? So you're kind of triangulating a bit. So we asked them to order train tickets using four different interfaces. We asked them then to say, which interface do you prefer? And then we would group them with someone who had a different preference. And we had them argue. And they had to agree in the end. Well, we couldn't force them, but that was the task goal. Then we said, OK, so that's what you think. Now, here's all the data from the 140 students going through this exercise. Does that make you change your mind? And then the teacher debriefed. So conceptually, it's a fairly simple script. I can explain it in not so many words. The graph, when we simplify it, kind of looks like this. You do an individual train activity. Uh, you state your preference. Here we have a chat that's open the whole time. We have the group preference. And then we have another one where we also show them the data. So when things are stacked, it means they're on, at, on the screen at the same time. And then the teacher does a debriefing both of their choices and uh, the choices before data and after data. Now, the real graph is more complex, both because of this data flow, but also because this was actually an experiment. So we also had an experimental design. We had informed consent. There's you know, things like that. There's a, we, we wrote a paper about this, if anyone's interested. Uh, still waiting to see if it's accepted. So what does this look like? So we have this train activity. It's a fairly unique tool for a learning management system or a learning platform. But the nice thing about Frog is that it's also a platform. So all the tools are plugins. And our goal is that it should be very easy, if you're doing research on these kind of things, to build a new tool as a Frog plugin rather than building it from scratch. And then if you do that, you, you get to take advantage of all the other stuff that we already have built in. So 
you know, I'm, I can order a ticket with a pull down menu. I can order it um, with a command line. I have to check the help because I didn't remember the syntax. Uh, we have a drag and drop interface. And the students had to order three tickets with each interface. So this took more than 10 minutes. And this was quite tedious, right? This in itself is not really a learning task. But the goal was to have them really experience uh, what it feels like um, and to generate some data. So now we say, great, um, here's the four interfaces. Can you rank them in order? And tell us why. So I'm going to say I like the command line better. I can change the rating here if I want. So now the train activity was something very custom, but this is just a ranking that we could rank anything here. We just happen to use it for this. Now we put you in a group. So here's student one, here's student two. Um, we have a little chat bot that introduces the students to each other. So this is Anna ranked like this, Trina ranked like this. And now in this case, they both have to come up with the same rankings, but one can only enter on this one side, and the other can only enter on the other side, and one can only, so each person is control of one side, but they have to match before you can submit. So again, we're trying to make it hard for them because we don't want them to just say, yes, we agree, okay, next. We want them to actually kind of figure it out. So after a while, we show them the data. Uh, and I'll show you how that looked afterwards. And then we ask them again. And in the end, uh, there's a debrief. Ah, I don't have this. So Frog has a few key ingredients. It has these rich activity types. Um, and just to give you an example of these tools, so collaborative editing, Google Docs, some of you have used Etherpad, right? These are great tools to get students to work, or even academics use, use these to, to coordinate. Uh, we have this built into Frog. So it lets us do a lot of, this gives us a lot more flexibility. For example, we can have students watch a video while they're taking notes. But we can also have them do some collaborative coding and run some automated te uh, tests uh, whether it's in an online session or whether it's in the classroom. Or even this gallery of, of physics-related images where we ask the students to, to comment. This comment field supports collaboration. And that would be hard to do with Google Docs. And here's uh, the latest um, thing is a rich text editor that also uh, supports kind of rich content from other sources like Twitter, uh, supports a spreadsheet with uh, formulas. So this in itself is kind of a cool tool, but what makes it really interesting is that it can be automatically assigned to individuals, to groups, it can flow, right? So these activity types are one of the building blocks. Uh, yeah, so you have a dashboard for the programming, you have lists, you have all kinds of fun stuff that I'm not going to show you because of time. Um, then we have these operators to support data flow. So operators, most of them right now are very simple, right? Create random groups of three people, um, assign pairs of this, but the goal is to actually enable all kinds of algorithms to do more complex things. So we already have the idea of forming pairs of opposites, right? But right now that's based on you answering a quiz, which we pre-code to say this question is on that axis and so on. Uh, what we're working on is semantic technology to be able to have students write short text answers and then cluster them either by similarity or by difference. Because if you're in a MOOC with 2,000 people, you might want similar people together to, to avoid the kind of, you know, I'm lost in this mass, right? So it's up to the teacher. Um, the collaborative writing that is built into Frog generates a huge amount of data. And we have a, have a project where we're trying to see if we can automatically recognize the writing strategy, the roles different students uh, take. Is one person adding a lot of new information, the other one is, is organizing it or fixing the spelling mistakes. The stage in the writing process, right? Are they brainstorming? Are they organizing? Are they 
and even predicting when students will be done with an open-ended task. Another example, which I mentioned earlier, is to predict when students... So right now we can predict when students will be done with a well-defined task. So if you have a quiz with 10 questions, or you need to buy 12 train tickets, um, here you see from actually the class, the, the train activity which I showed, this graph, the blue shows the average progress of the class through this activity, and the red shows the percentage of people who have completely finished it. So what happens when you run this at uh, much faster than actual speed, um, these dipole lines here are predictions. So this is what's actually happened so far, and this is the algorithm that is predicting when the class will be finished with this task. This was a master thesis in our lab, and talking about the learn and, and kind of bringing research into practice, this algorithm was built into Frog before he defended his master thesis. So our goal is really to take cutting-edge research and make it available for people to use. And this is now something that we will keep updating and, and improve both the look, but also the actual underlying algorithm. And as we do that, anyone who's using Frog and gives a quiz will get access to this. They don't have to look at it, but if they want, it's there. So the idea is you have these algorithms, which EPFL is very good at, right? deep learning, semantic networks, uh, predicting, you know, uh, predicting progress, predicting understanding. And if we put one of those into Frog, it can fuel dashboards for teachers. So for example, now we have word clouds for the chat. Word clouds are really simplistic and not very meaningful. But we're almost ready to have a semantic word cloud, which is actually able to do topic extraction and tell you what the different groups are talking about real time. But with the same algorithm, we could redistribute student data. So we could say, well, this student um, wrote a personal reflection, and now I want to send him another student's reflection that's very different or very similar, depending <coughs> on the teacher. But instead of sending the reflection, we could send the student. So we'll say, hey, you wrote the personal reflection. I'm going to group you with someone who wrote very similar or very different from you. Or maybe we even say that we want to split and say the people who wrote like this, they go to this activity, and other people go to this other activity. So the idea is really taking machine learning, taking learning analytics, taking the cutting edge stuff that we're building, and making it available for teachers in many different ways. Um, very briefly, Frog is still under heavy development, uh, but it has been used a few different places, um, from a methods course for future teachers, Latin American studies course, uh, statistics intro. That's three times 300 students in a large lecture at UNIL. And they're actually doing, they're, they're collecting data about themselves, like how many coffee cups did you drink the last 24 hours? What's your shoe size? What's your gender? And then we give them that data back, and we have an interface where they can play with uh, different distributions, different ways of plotting it. Because the idea is, these are business students. And uh, the goal is not so much for them to learn the proofs, but to get a, um, an intuition for different distributions, probability methods, and so on. Um, there's an online master course in uh, Minnesota, and also a middle school in Romanshorn which uh, is uh, actually using this for language learning. Um, and more to come, hopefully, because if you would like to use Frog in your class, um, here's just a few examples of things that you could do. I mean, it's, so part of the problem with Frog is that it, we take, we, we try to really say, what are all the possible things that people could do, and how can we make the, this stuff fit together in any possible way? And that's really powerful, but it's also overwhelming. And it's part of the reason why the interface right now looks a bit cluttered. So one thing we're doing is to simplify the common cases a lot that will be coming. Another thing is to say, okay, here are some cases that might, you know, gel with you. So, for example, any kind of, you know, seminar class, 30 students, they're discussing, they're brainstorming, they're peer reviewing, they're writing something, they're uploading an image, they're, you know, these kind of scenarios could apply to almost any subject. Uh, and they fit Frog extremely well. Flipped classroom, all right? So Frog is mainly right now for synchronous learning. But what we could do already very easily is to have one activity that's open for a week. And we can easily embed this into Moodle, for example. So imagine you have the students do a reading, 
Uh, and then in the Moodle, there's just a text field uh, with that cool editor you just saw. And we say, you know, summarize last week's lesson, or what was the mo most important topic from the reading, or, you know, depending on, on your learning goals. Then you come into class and you can actually use that information. So first of all, that's telling you as a teacher something about where your student's at. But you could also then say, hey, go into pairs. I'm going to pull up the two things that you two wrote, and I'll spend the first five minutes discussing that. And that's a simple thing that I think could work on almost any class, uh, just having students really reflect on their own learning. Uh, large lectures that already maybe are using clickers, but would like to maybe push that a little bit further in ways that a, a traditional clicker cannot do it. Um, also, I didn't show it here, but we're, there's some really cool stuff going on with um, annotating PDFs, where we can actually, or, or websites. So if you have a class where students are reading academic papers uh, or anything, and you want them to do really active in-depth reading, we can pull all those annotations into Frog and have the students work with them. That's what the, the, the course in Minnesota is doing. So very quickly at the end, we're also looking for research collaborations. So you know, if you're interested in looking at algorithms that we can use, visualizations, um, if you're interested in innovative collaborative interfaces for how people can do different things live, whether it's programming, uh, simulations, uh, just writing. Frog is open source. It's available on GitHub. It's not ready for prime time. You can play with it, but if you want to use it in a class, it's for now probably better to talk to us, but we're super happy to talk to you. Um, and there's also a, a blog here where we're trying to document some of the examples that I showed today and some other examples. So thank you very much. <laughs>